hello and thank you so much for taking the time to do this interview how are you doing today i'm good how are you i'm okay too a couple of days ago you released the first volume of your uh double album dealing with demons uh how has everything been with the release and the reactions and all sorts of stuff it's been great overwhelmingly positive it's uh, i don't think the band has had this good of a response with an album release since the uh, last kind words which is our third record uh it's uh it's a good feeling unfortunately it has to happen during a pandemic but i'll take it Yeah. Glad people are liking it. Yeah, and well, at least the bright side is more people have more time to to listen to music and sit down and really get the album rather than just listen to a couple of songs here and there, I guess. I would think so. I mean, it's really not that hard to listen to music anyway. You can do it almost anywhere, but maybe people are looking for some uh looking a little harder for some comfort these days than before. Are the hours leading up to an album release are they still stressful for you after all these years or does it come like you know easily It comes easily I I don't get really stressed out you know the first week is kind of important for the band you know because you want to see what your first week numbers are and then after that it's kind of like okay first week is over you know anything from here doesn't matter anymore it is what it is but I would say I was more anxious than anything because we finished this record over a year ago and you know we did I finished up with all my parts on the record and you know there was a six month gap between finishing up the the musical parts or the instrumentation until Des did vocals so the record actually is a bit old for us at this point already you know we've been listening to it I mean I stopped listening to it for a few months but you know leading up to the release i started listening to it again just to kind of get myself excited about it but you know it's it's a little foreign to me already yeah <laughs> yeah i mean are you more excited now about it again or still kind of mad <laughs> i'm i'm more excited just because of the response that we we've, we've been getting you know i have you know i even had some old band members call me up and be like dude this album is fucking awesome <laughs> You know, it's much better than Trust No One. I'm like, yeah, I know. It it is, but uh you know, I'm never sure until we you know, I get some feedback from it. Yeah. And uh I definitely have more friends in the industry and just friends that, you know, people I've gone with, you know, I've known since high school texting me and being like like okay, how did you guys pull this one out of your ass? Like, what's different? I'm like I don't know, but it was it was a fun record to make. Maybe that's why, you know, it's just we had a lot of fun making it and I think it shows. Yeah, it's also, I mean, the previous album was of course a cover song, so it's it's back to writing original material since 2016. Um how was it for you to go back through that process of writing new songs and original songs to you? I've been doing it for 16 years and you know with Devil Driver and you know I was in some bands before this. Yeah, I've been doing it so long. I don't stress out over it. I just it's a fun process. I like, you know, being in my studio and sitting down with my guitar and just spending the whole day writing and or the whole week. You know, when I'm working on a record, I'll literally write seven days a week for like somewhere between 8 to 12 hours a day and I just love it I look forward to it. Do you feel like your process over time has changed in, well when you take this album in account were there things you did differently writing wise? Yeah. Um one thing that Neil and I actually sat down and discussed about how we were going to write songs for this record is that we were going to slow things down and open things up and you know with that kind of mindset it it helps things groove a little bit more and you know you can make songs slam a little bit harder when they're a little bit slower paced not to say that we didn't have the the higher tempo songs on the record there's mm-hmm. definitely some of those but that was something that I we both went in the mindset with to do on this record but I also 
I wanted to get away from writing the way that I used to in the past. You know, everything I wrote was very melodic. It wasn't very dissonant. And dissonance is one thing that I've really been embracing a lot with rhythms as well as my any kind of lead or solo work and just kind of making things sound more ugly and more dark. And like, it, it just more ugly than dark. I think all the stuff I write is fairly dark sounding anyway, but, um, uh, just embracing things that I had never really embraced before that I wish I would have started doing sooner. Is that something for the future that you were also planning to experiment more with, for instance? Yeah. And I'm going to take it even a step further when we start working on the next record, because I feel like we're at, we're at a point in our career where we've released an overwhelming amount of material at this point and with the you know now that we've released the song like wishing that with des singing clean vocals and i have a lot of people telling me that's their favorite song on the record that it's like oh, okay you know we we can start experimenting now i'm not saying that i'm going to go write a whole song for des to sing clean vocals over but i'm going to start adding things that i normally wouldn't have in the past because um now Des has kind of proven to everyone that he doesn't have limitations on what he can do. And I'm definitely going to push him even further down that road on the next record, you know, and write something that it's like, well, what do you want me to do with this? It's like, well, look what you did with wishing, go figure it out. Are there things that you would like to try maybe someday that you haven't tried before in your kind of music? Uh, basically, you know, I'm a big industrial fan and a big goth fan. Now, Des isn't so much into industrial, but he is really into goth. And I'd like to start throwing some of those influences in to our music. Not a lot. I mean, it'll still be Devil Driver. We're never going to be considered a goth or an industrial <laughs> band. But, if you you know, I've gone back and listened to stuff that I've written for the band in the past. And I'm like, well, that sounds like Sisters of Mercy. And I'm like, well, it kind of makes sense because they're one of my favorite bands. And I didn't even know when I was writing it, but looking back on it years later, you know, I see that influence in my own writing and yeah. I'm going to, whatever we, we release, it's going to be heavy and it's going to be considered metal, but I'm going to try to go in with the mindset of, you know, don't write metal all the time. You know, like when, when the riff comes together as a whole and we get together with the band and everything like that, we're going to figure out how to make it heavy. But, try to think outside the box a little bit more than I have. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the song Wishing, uh, which has Des and clean vocals, of course. Um, but because of an another interview that I watched, I understood that um, the clean vocals came about with uh, your producer, Steve Evitz. Uh, I was wondering if there are some other elements in the production that you were specifically excited about next to those clean vocals. The way we did guitar rhythm guitars on this record is much different than we ever have in the past. Steve wanted, you know, we always record a rhythm on the left and a rhythm on the right. And, you know, sometimes we do one on each side. Sometimes we'll do one on each side with one in the middle. And we've done records where we have two on each side. And I'm not a big fan of doing it with two on each side. I, I like doing one on each side. I just like the way it sounds better now. But in, in 10 years, I'll probably change my mind and go back to four. Who knows? Uh, I am like that. But he wanted Neil on one side and me on the other. And we've never done that before because Neil gets a lot more low end bass out of the way he plays a guitar. And I have a little bit more bite and high end in my playing. So he insisted on me and Neil, you know, learning all the songs and playing on all the songs. And so whenever you're listening to this record, it's me on one side, it's Neil on the other. And we also used a completely different configuration for each side. So he was playing through a completely different guitar with a completely different overdrive pedal into a different amp and sometimes even a different speaker cabinet. And we've, that's something that we've never done before. You know, we got our rhythm tone, we put it on each side from the same amp, pretty much the same configuration on every song. And I think Steve wanted to do it that way because it was going to be a double record 
And I think he knew going into it that it's like, okay, we're going to have to break up the monotony of these songs uh, more than usual because there's so much material. And like I said, we had never done that before. And I think it was a fantastic mm-hmm. idea. I think the, this is one of the best sounding records we've ever put out, you know, from a production standpoint. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's actually interesting that the, the, like the reason that it's um it's a double album was taken into account while doing the production. I didn't really. Uh, it was taken into account before we even wrote a single note. Okay. It was like, you guys want to do this double record? I'm like, yeah, sure, okay, let's do a double record because, you know. You can't go into a with a producer and you know say we're doing a record and then all of a sudden hit them and say we got to do a double record. You know it's like <laughs> there's you know, there's contracts, there's scheduling and all that stuff. So it's like you know we had to prepare Steve Evans for this and you know he he told me at the end of it that he'll probably never do a double record ever again. Like this will be he had never done it before and he's like I don't know if I will ever do it again because. <laughs> he had to work harder on this record than anybody because once it's all said and done, you know, he's got to go mix it. And that's literally another month of work for the, you know, for the producer to, to do it. And mostly me, him and our other guitar player, Neil spent the most time in the studio together because, you know, there's so many different layers of guitars going on. It takes us the longest amount of time. So, I mean, we spent so much time in the studio together It was just like <laughs> it. It just sometimes it felt like it was never going to end. But but in the long run, it was fun. I had a good time, and I totally go. I'd do it again. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I also really liked about the album is that there's certain like motives subtly returning throughout the you know throughout the whole songs, and also phrases like dealing with demons in the lyrics, for instance. Um, were these things things you added on later, or was that something that you incorporated already when you laid out the tracks in the beginning? Uh, well, first of all, I don't have anything to do with um, the whole vocal situation when it comes to recording. You know, we were done with all the instrumentation six months before Des even started doing vocals. And he does that, you know, with just the producer down at his house. And I'm sure he wouldn't mind if I came by, but he lives two hours away. And um, I think I was busy working on the, uh, the Wednesday 13 record at the time. But, um, you know, is as far as the layout of, like, the tracks on volume one and two, that wasn't decided until after the recording was done. You know, we, we did all the songs. We had a look at what we had. And then I think Neil came up with the uh, the first track listing and sent it to me. I was like, cool. Sent it to Dez. And I think the record label on Dez might have changed it a little bit here and there. And that was it. So, all right. These songs are going on volume one. These songs are going on volume two. That actually sounds pretty easier than I would have imagined. Yeah, it was. Um, it might have been harder. Uh, <laughs> it might have harder <laughs> for Neil because he's the one that came up with the original yeah. track listing. But um, I try to take myself out of those equations now. You know, I've learned over the years that I'm not the best person to ask what should be released first because I personally have. Um, You know, certain songs are more important to me than others. And just because, but that's from a writing perspective. It's not from a listening perspective. And I like to get input from, you know, people outside of the band. And, you know, even, you know, the producer, I think, is a good person to ask. I mean, he's a little bit closer to the music than the average listener is, but he's still more of a listener than anything. And, uh, Um, you know, record label, friends, family, wives, girlfriends, you know, I think those are people, good people to ask after you play the record for them and, to, you know, kind of see what songs stand out mm-hmm. amongst a group of people rather than me saying this song should be the first one released, but because yeah. it's usually going to be a song that I, that I wrote and I know that. So I'm like, I have a biased opinion and I should be taken out of the equation. So in 2018, I think uh, I read somewhere that you guys had written like 48 songs for the new album. 
was it difficult to pare down on on songs for you and how did you make those decisions in the end it was it wasn't difficult you know neil had he had a lot more material written for this record before i did you know he got a big head start on it i was busy doing the wednesday 13 record i had some other projects going on and he probably had 20 songs written before i even wrote one you know he was throwing all these songs into a dropbox folder that we created for demos and i you know i'm going through and i'm just like jesus christ man i gotta hurry up and start writing you know <laughs> if, I, if i want any of my own material on this record so once i started writing you know we neil has a tendency to write songs that aren't necessarily complete and i write songs that are definitely not complete either but i don't show them to anybody else in the band until it technically could be a full song you know, and if I'm stuck on something, you know, I'll probably I'll I'll always have an idea for it, even if I'm stuck on something. I'll get stuck on something because I have three or four options of what I want to put in a particular place. And then I'll have Neil and Austin help me with that decision. But, is you know, one day we'll do uh, you know one of my songs. One day we'll do one of Austin songs. Our drummer plays guitar as well. And he wrote some really cool shit for this record. And then we'll do one of Neil's songs. And. I'll just go through the Dropbox and throw them into iTunes. And I literally rate all the songs from one to five stars uh, that the other guys are doing just so, and it's not so much, it's just the ones that I wanted to work on. So yeah. Neil would come over. I'm like, okay, well let's look at all the ones that I rated five stars and let's pick one and we'll just pick up, pick one, work on it until it's done. And in the long run, some songs make the records and some songs don't, you know, it's, you kind of once all all the writing is pretty much done, you can step back and go, okay, this song is one hundred percent, and you you can usually do that, Lino, when you're doing twenty songs, at least half of them, and then, you know, some of them were decided when we were actually in pre-production when it was our producer and me, Austin and and Neil just playing the songs together, mm. and you know, we decided I think on like. I remember there was two other songs that I wrote that uh, we didn't end up using. And, you know, Neil had so many songs that he had written. Of course, they, you know, weren't all going to gonna be released because, he, we, you know, we had so many. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if some of those songs ended up on the next record. Well, yeah, not just... the next record, the, the one after Dealing with Demons Volume 2. Yeah, I was just going to ask, what do you do with the leftover songs? Do they usually still appear somewhere in the future? Usually not. I mean, I always try to uh, start fresh. If I hit a roadblock in writing, sometimes I'll go back and look for certain riffs and be like, okay, you know what, uh, that's a good place to start. And I'll see it a different way. Like, yeah, I can understand like why this this song didn't make it is because this part's getting a little boring and like I could definitely make that better I can replace it with something completely different but for the most part we start fresh there is actually there's one song uh that I believe is on yeah it's on volume two so it's not out yet but the main riff of the song I wrote probably seven years ago maybe even longer than that and uh I want to say I think that's the only one I think mo pretty much everything that I wrote for the record was pretty was done specifically for this record. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you mentioned Volume Two, can you maybe briefly explain what what fans can expect from the second half of the album? It's the second half of the record, you know. <laughs> it's it was all written together, and it's basically a continuation of dealing with demons. So I can. I can honestly say that with a lot of certainty that if you like volume one, you're going to like volume two. Why did you guys decide to release them separately? Was it maybe because of the pandemic and it's nice to release new music or was that always the case? That was always the case. We wanted to stagger them. That's what felt right for us. And I think 20 songs is too much for people to absorb all at once. And especially these days, I think everyone's attention span has diminished a lot over the last two decades. And 
uh, you know, I, there's a lot of bands not even releasing full records anymore. And, you know, in the nineties, people were putting, you know, anywhere between 13 and seven, or actually probably sometime even like 18 songs on a record, you know, Antichrist superstar had, you know, 16, I think red hot chili peppers, most famous record, blood sugar, sex, magic. I want to say it had like 18 songs on it. And now we're kind of reverting back to the ways that things were in the 60s and the 70s where people are only putting nine or ten songs on a record. So it's, uh, you know, things are going full circle. Yeah. How do you actually feel about that change? Because, you know, singles are also becoming more important in, in these ages. Most of the bands I listen to still release full records. You know, I think the releasing singles and... EPs. There are bands in our genre releasing EPs a fair amount these days, but um, it doesn't affect me much because because of that. I do like listening to full records. That's the way I grew up. I'm sometimes I think EPs or can be a little too short to really wrap my uh, to want to listen to them over and over again. I think the fewer songs, the less you'll listen, you'll keep on listening to the record on repeat. Yeah, because it because you're obviously you're listening to the same songs more often. So when someone releases at least ten songs on a record, I think I have a tendency to listen to it longer than uh, EPs or singles. Mm -hmm. um, now um, I recently watched uh, the lyric video for "Keep Away from Me." Obviously, this song is not. I guess it's not really about COVID nineteen, but it's more about agoraphobia. But I was wondering whose idea it was to kind of tie up the both themes, events, or whatever, together, and how did you basically come up with the concept of the video? I'm sure it was Des and our director, Vicente. Um, you know, we had, the, the ironic thing is, is we decided that was going to be the first single on the record way before uh, COVID-19 hit, and... Yeah, it was just a very weird coincidence that we, you know, this whole social distancing thing went into effect. And then we have a song that we're about to release called Keep Away From Me. And, you know, I was, well, okay, that's kind of weird, but it, it, it kind of works for the time. So we made a video that revolves around what's going on. And um, it, 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 it kind of ties two things together in a way it ties the agoraphobia aspect of things as well as COVID-19, which, you know, now are very related because it seems like the whole world in one way or another, not everybody, obviously, but a lot of people are, I think they're going to be a little traumatized for the rest of their life after uh, being so secluded for such a long time. Mm. Yeah. In this record, you're, you're talking about a lot of mental health, issues and, and you know demons basically um, but is it important for you guys to make music that people can basically relate to I think it is important for a band's success to have people relate to their music obviously but that's not I don't think we don't write music purposely to uh, make other people happy You know, we got to make ourselves happy first and hope that translates to uh, the, the, the metal community. And if you're writing music for someone else, you know, it, which is fine. <laughs> you know, I've had people approach me and can you like, can you write a song like this? And, you know, I'll pay you X amount and be like, yeah, sure, I'll do it. But I would never write for Devil Driver that way. That's way too personal. And... You know, you you just got to be honest with yourself and hope that it translates to other people. And I think that's what makes, you know, a, a successful band sex, successful. I mean, obviously, there are people out there that are musical puppets and which is fine. You know, if you just want to be a performer and you got other people writing your music, you know, Elvis Presley never wrote a single song, but he's a total badass. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, it's fine, but that's not how we do it with Double Driver. You know, we always write our own music and um, write it the way that we want. And, yeah. you know, the song Wishing is is a good example of that. It's not what people expected. I don't think it's even what people were asking from us. 
even if we went out and did a national survey of what Devil Driver fans want and we threw the idea of clean vocals in there, I'm sure this response would be overwhelmingly no. But <laughs> you were like, tough shit. You're going to get this anyway. We hope you like it. And it ended up working for the better for us, you know? And most people do really like that song. I, I you know, I was surprised when I heard it. I didn't know he was going to do clean vocals on it. I wasn't there. And when I got it, you know, Des was a little nervous about releasing it. And I'm like, dude, trust me, don't touch a thing. It's good. And then I thought, I told him, I think it's so good. It should be one of the, like the third of the fourth single off the record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think you, you guys definitely have like open-minded fans because uh, from that song, every comment that I read at least was super positive as well. So. Yeah, we did something right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, you mentioned also that you guys have been sitting on this album for quite a while now. It was like written quite a while ago. Um, so I'm guessing you were really looking forward to play it live, uh, finally. But of course, because of the pandemic, uh, well, that's not happening soon, I guess. But, um, a lot of bands are now streaming concerts and stuff like that. Is that something that's feasible for Devil Driver? Is that something you're interested in at all? I'd be interested in doing it if we did it correctly with a lot of production and made it super cool. I haven't sat down to watch the one that Behemoth did, but I've heard some really good things about it. And I know that Behemoth, when they they only do things well, you know, I've toured with them and I've seen them live and I was really impressed the first time I saw them. And um, If we could do it equally as cool, I'd be up for doing it. But if we can't make it something super special, then I don't want to. Okay. But as of now, we don't have any plans to do it. We've yeah. talked about it, obviously, and thrown the idea out there. But as of now, there's no plan to, to do any kind of streaming show yet. Yeah, I guess it also depends how the situation is going to go further. Yeah, and I'm kind of wondering if we're starting to get to the point where people are already starting to get sick of watching streaming shows, you know, because I don't think they're going to last. You know, I don't, I don't think it's I think it's a temporary fix. During yeah. A bad situation anyhow we've been talking for about half an hour so and most of my questions are, are like uh gone um do you have any last thoughts you want to share with people watching this video you know i tell people you know try to find some com comfort in the fact that we don't really have a choice but other than to go through this and uh we'll get back to touring as soon as we can and you know i'm uh looking forward to getting out there again whenever we can play a show again it's going to be it's going to be a bit bizarre but i think it'll be a lot of fun more fun than any show we've done in a long time 